Hi guys, I'm George Dolan. Welcome back to my film journal. My first video of 2023 in my new studio. Uh, I know with the ringing in of the new year, everyone's getting excited about all of the new Hollywood blockbusters that'll be coming out this summer. Amongst them, the long-awaited fifth installment of the Indiana Jones series, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And after watching the trailer, it got me thinking about the series and the character and how much of the conversation around the character is framed by the admission of Spielberg and Lucas that the series is really an amalgamation of influences from 1950s action adventure serials and movies. Movies like, I would guess, Valley of the Kings from 1954, which is a pretty lackluster movie, worth watching, I think, really for the Technicolor location shooting of ancient Egypt. And then you have films, a uh, better movie like Secrets of the Incas, which is pretty good, uh, but I think mostly it's remembered for its relationship to Indiana Jones as we see Charlton Heston, its star, dressed in a very familiar outfit. Uh, but we also have movies like the one we're going to be talking about today, which is a grittier, darker, a little bit of an edgier movie with its influences and structure rooted more in pulp, crime fiction, and film noir. Nevertheless, there are some great sequences of tomb raiding adventure, and the movie, like the Indiana Jones series, has a great travelogue feel to it as they shot in Mexico on location at some magnificent ancient ruins. Um, it's a really cool movie, and I think it's one that is underrated. So, without further ado, Plunder of the Sun from 1953, directed by John Farrow and starring Glenn Ford. Let's get started. Plunder of the Sun begins as an Indiana Jones film often might, or should begin, with our character in the throes of a separate adventure. While this time it's not an action set piece intro, still, our lead Al Colby is kicking around in Havana. He's not a native to the island. Obviously he's an American. So what's he doing there? We never find out, but we can assume that this hard-edged misanthrope must have been drawn there for a reason. We can only imagine what kind of trouble he's gotten himself into, waiting for a check to arrive in the mail. From who or for what services rendered, we are never told. But he's unable to pay his bill at the sweaty local hotel. How he manages his debt is a good insight into his character. Maybe you didn't hear what I said. Manana. Al retires to a bar, having one of the many amber-colored, generously-headed Mexican surveys as he will enjoy throughout the movie, when he meets a mysterious woman, coming on to him with an elegant lament for her perfect night with the perfect man. I've been under lock and key for so long, and now, and now at last I have a chance to do all the things I thought of. Cocktails at the National, dinner at El Patio, Pelota at the Fronton. That's quite a program. Oh, I haven't even begun. I would like to go dancing, and I'd like to visit the cantinas and see rumbas like, like I've never seen them before. And then, then if there is moonlight. Oh, oh this, this moonlight. Oh, yeah. A drive along the ocean. You know, you're making it sound better and better. Patricia Medina plays the character, Anna Luce. And this is her standout moment in the film, as our would-be femme fatale tends to fade into the background for the remainder of the movie. And I feel the personal history and revelations about her past leave something to be desired. The lure of sex is a ruse, however, and the audience discovers that something is amiss when Anna Luce's home is revealed to be a stuffy parlor filled with trinkets and ancient Mexican artifacts. This can't be her place, right? No, it's not. It's Thomas Berrians, an invalid collector of South American antiques. He needs Colby to smuggle a very important artifact into Mexico through customs. Well, why don't you do it yourself? I am too well known in Mexico. My baggage and my person will be thoroughly searched. But for you, an American tourist, there will be no trouble. Colby agrees, and the trio set sail for what should be a fairly simple smuggling gig. However, it's soon apparent to Colby that the other passengers on board the vessel aren't simple tourists and perhaps have their eyes on the mysterious package he's taped to his chest. Raul Cornejo, son of a famous Mexican historian and his female companion, Julie Barnes, a woman fond of a few margaritas who isn't shy about flirting with Colby, and the enigmatic silver-haired Jefferson, someone who has an obvious history with Berrien. But you must be very careful. There is a man on board who would do anything to get it. Jefferson? How did you know? 
your face when you saw him? I'm afraid of him. Why? He is a crook. Oh, really? Do you know something? Down the bar, he said the same thing about you. Colby even begins to suspect the seemingly innocent Anna Luce after finding that she's ransacked his cabin and ultimately finding Barry in dead, plausibly from a heart attack. Still, foul play can't be ruled out. After navigating the Mexican customs agents, the remaining players settle into a local hotel, where their uneasy detente begins to rupture. Everyone is after the package. An increasingly intricate web of relationships and revelations come to the fore as the characters attempt to form alliances with Colby to obtain the package, the contents of which are revealed to be a map to an ancient Zapotec treasure. What transpires throughout the movie is an engaging cat and mouse little adventure story with a lot of twists and turns, shifting allegiances and intrigue, hallmarks of David Dodge's work, and for the most part, the movie sticks fairly closely to the novel, despite the fact that the original story takes place mostly in Peru. Dodge was a pretty prolific writer of noir and adventure fiction. His most popular work, To Catch a Thief, was of course adapted by Alfred Hitchcock into the excellent film starring Cary Grant and Grace Kelly. The Al Colby character was the central figure in three of David Dodge's novels, Plunder of the Sun being the second in the series. And I was first turned on to the story when I picked up the Hard Case Crime edition, republishing the novel after many decades out of print. And it's a really enjoyable and fast read. The character narration by Colby is really strong, with typical hard-boiled gusto. But the strongest and most engaging element is the attention to cultural and geographical detail as it pertains to South America and Mexico. Al Colby is a fairly atypical pulp hero, as his stories take place primarily in South America. Colby is a character of American origin, but born and based in Mexico City, which sets him apart from many pulp heroes of the time, typically based in American metropolitan areas. Mexico and South America were very dear to Dodge, who in addition to his fiction output also produced many popular travelogues and tourist guides, like The Poor Man's Guide to Europe and The Best of Mexico by Car, as he was a well-traveled and pretty adventurous guy. The movie's director, John Farrow, notably the father of actress Mia Farrow, was cut from the same cloth as Dodge. He was a soldier in World War I, he was a sailor in his youth, and then he became a prolific studio director, and the production takes great advantage of the locales, with beautiful photography of the Zapotecan ruins of Milta and Monte Alblon in Oaxaca, Mexico, where the movie was filmed. Reportedly, the local government and citizens of Oaxaca were so excited by the prospect of a Hollywood production in their city that all of the town's children were given a week off of school. A parade was thrown for the production, and the film crew was given carte blanche in their use of the ruins as a location. So much so, that the team was even given the okay to personally excavate and dig up more of the ruins to accentuate the impressive structures when it came to being on film. Something like that would never occur today, and supposedly the key grips given shovels and picks managed to dig up even more artifacts and historical treasures in the process. The filming also happened to coincide with a state visit by then Vice President Richard Nixon, and the stars and crew were invited to the state dinner, something that Glenn Ford reported in a letter home to his mother. After having initially read the book and enjoyed it and discovering there was a film adaption, I put off watching it mostly because I'd never been a big Glenn Ford fan. I'd seen some of his popular films like Gilda, a movie where I feel he kind of fades into the background in service of Rita Hayworth, who really steals the show, and I'd always thought of him as a rather downcast and diminutive presence, one that I wasn't really too interested in. But in this film, he works great, and I finally get his appeal. He's a scrapper, a tough guy in the vein of Humphrey Bogart. He's out for himself, and at times in the film, relentlessly cruel, especially to the character of Julie Barnes, whose affections he violently rejects by humiliating her. Take a good look at yourself. Who'd want to kiss that? This behavior comes back to bite him in the ass when Julie betrays him and gives up the location of the package to her boyfriend, Raoul. What I really like about Ford's performance here, though, is his vulnerability, something that the Indiana Jones films would take to heart, as Indy, like Al Colby, often gets beaten down, taking a series of punches. They're not always the strongest and toughest, but their dogged resolve helps them win the day. Ford plays Colby as a street-smart cynic, and I enjoyed the finesse with which he completes little mundane tasks. His efficiency and movement are really graceful, like in this little moment where he cuts up the manuscript so that one would have to steal both envelopes to see the entire message, after taking master photographs so that the ancient writing could be deciphered later with the master list. Now, Ford's not the biggest guy, but he looks great in a suit. I've been thinking a lot about classic tailoring lately, as an antidote to the relentless insistence that modern suits be vacuum sealed to the man wearing it. Ford's suits here in the film, as with many classic Hollywood stars, 
fit great, and probably have the effect of making him look bigger, brawnier. And the easily fitted, flowing clothing does a lot to make an actor's movement interesting in these old films, where most of the action is filmed in wider shots with less cutting on action than we see today. So you can count me as a Glenn Ford fan now. I think he's great in the movie. Plunder of the Sun was produced by John Wayne's Batjack Productions. Supposedly, Wayne was offered the part and rightly identified it as not right for him, instead offering it to Ford, and the two remained good friends for the remainder of their lives. Plunder was the first of what would be a handful of movies produced by the studio that didn't star Wayne. These were often adventure and action pictures like Ring of Fear, a thriller starring real-life animal trainer Clyde Beatty and detective author Mickey Spillane, creator of Mike Hammer, playing themselves. Or offbeat westerns like the relentlessly depressing deconstructionist film Track of the Cat, starring Robert Mitchum. Wayne often utilized Batjack as a way to help struggling actor friends like troubled alcoholic actress Gail Russell, given a leading role in the Batjack production of Seven Men From Now, which was her first acting role in five years. Or to employ a rotating stable of directors and actors that he just liked working with, actors like his good friend Ward Bond, or director John Farrow, who would follow up Plunder of the Sun by directing Wayne in Hondo, one of the actor's most notable films. Batjack regulars often came to be referred to as the John Wayne Stock Company. Sean McClory, who plays Jefferson here in the movie, starred in many Wayne films after his appearance in The Quiet Man, where he and Wayne got along well, including the villain role in Ring of Fire and as a fellow pilot in Island in the Sky. McClory's role as Jefferson is particularly memorable. He's a schemer with peculiar but striking style choices. His hair dyed white, the Ray-Ban sunglasses he rarely removes, seem to presage the idea of the eccentric character details of the Bond and, of course, eventually the Indiana Jones henchman archetype. Think Robert Shaw in From Russia With Love. McClory became known as a character actor, willing to radically change his appearance for his many roles. His reputation as a master of disguise and an adept makeup artist was honed by McClory during his time in the Irish theater and as a struggling actor who had just moved to America. He would raid his costume and makeup case to change his identity in an attempt to donate blood sometimes up to three times a day in order to make ends meet. He's a great foil for Ford in the movie, and though their alliance is brief, the scenes in which they are forced to work together to decipher the treasure map are some of the movie's best. Ultimately, Al Colby is betrayed by Jefferson during the penultimate tomb raiding sequence, which leads to an exciting climax in the Mexican Museum, but all is set right at the end, of course. Plunder of the Sun is a unique little noir adventure movie with some of that archaeological exploratory action that we would come to see in Indiana Jones and National Treasure series. Um, I think it's an overlooked movie that's really fun. Pretty short, hour and 20 minutes long, but I hope after watching this video, you guys might want to seek it out. For me, it was especially enjoyable because where I live, it's incredibly cold right now. And seeing those beautiful Mexican vistas and all of the sweaty bars and haunts that they hang out in, there's also a lot of really great iconography of the Mexican underworld in the film. Uh, the movie really feels like it inhabits a space, it inhabits a milieu, and I really enjoy it. And obviously, Glenn Ford's and Sean McClory's performances are standouts. Um, thanks so much for watching, guys, and welcome to my brand new studio. Over the course of me creating this YouTube channel, I've moved four times, so hopefully this one will be a little more permanent. Uh, look forward to a review of The Fablemans and a discussion of Steven Spielberg's career next when I have Ryan from Cinecrisis back on the show. Thanks so much, guys. I'll see you next time.